Hello, friends. Welcome into another episode of the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Happy Masters Thursday for those who celebrate. Thanks so much for joining me today. Maybe taking a little bit of a break from the golf to break down some of the top tight ends in this draft. I am incredibly excited to be talking about both Dalton Kincaid as well as Luke Musgrave, two tight ends that are really, really fun to watch on tape and would bring a really fun receiving speed element to this Packers offense. So we're going to jump in right away since we are going over two different tight ends today. Let's start with Dalton Kincaid, who is a 6'4", 246-pound senior tight end out of Utah. He is 23 years old, which should... You know, if, if by now you've been following the Packers draft long enough, usually they like younger players, especially in the first round. Really the only exception to that in any recent history has been Devontae Wyatt a season ago, but he's 23 years old and he will turn 24 in October. So it's not like he just turned 23. He will be 24 early in this NFL season. So that is something that, again, if you've been following the Packers draft enough, that should give you a little bit of pause and saying, all right, that might be something that Green Bay doesn't usually like to do. Uh, he did not test at the combine due to a knee injury or just recovering from his knee injury. Uh, he did obviously weigh in. His height was in the 37th percentile. His weight was in the 36th percentile. But again, we won't have RAS or a relative athletic score or any athletic testing numbers again because he did not test at the combine. Statistically, in 2018, he played at San Diego. He had 24 catches, 374 yards, and 11 touchdowns, which is pretty impressive. In 2019, he had 44 catches, 835 yards, and eight touchdowns. In 2020, he had one catch for 14 yards. That was the COVID shortened season, of course. That was his first year at Utah. In 2021, he had 36 catches, 510 yards, and eight touchdowns. And in 2022, he had 70 catches, 890 yards, and eight touchdowns. For those of you who have not done the counting at home, that is 35 career touchdowns in technically five seasons, but really one catch 14 yards in 2020. You can basically wipe that one away. So really 35 touchdowns in four seasons, two at San Diego, two at Utah. So some really impressive numbers and really was able to make an impact from his very first day at San Diego till his very last day at Utah. Um, other than again, that 2020 COVID shortened season, his numbers and his productivity, extremely impressive. From a PFF standpoint, in 2018, the grade, I, I didn't understand the grade. I think they just graded one of his games, but either way, neither here nor there. In 2019, he had an 80.4 grade on 195 snaps. In 2020, he had a 79.8 grade on only 99 snaps. On 2021, he had a 79.2 grade on 669 snaps. And then in 2022, his best grade, a 90.2 grade on 68 point, or excuse me, 682 snaps. So his snaps went up significantly over these past two seasons. And the grade this past year, a 90.2, his best overall grade by far. So again, you love those players in college that are continuing to get better as they go on through the course of their career, especially with Kincaid in this situation where where we saw consistency with his receiving numbers throughout his time at two different schools. And from a grading standpoint, he you know, continued to grade out better and better. Now, I will note here that PFF and their grades, his receiving grades were fantastic. His blocking grades, not so hot which is not going to be a surprise as we go through his scouting report here and go through his positives and negatives. Let's kick things off with his positives. He is a true pure receiving tight end. And he has every receiving chop that you want at the tight end position. He is a move tight end. You can move him around. He's basically a big slot wide receiver. You can use him in mismatches and he is going to find ways to get open. And even when he's not, he's going to find ways to get catches. And I think as evidenced by his productivity throughout his college career, you are going to see the catches. You are going to see the yards. You are going to see some after the catch stuff. You are going to see some touchdowns. You're going to see some red zone stuff. He is going to bring a little bit of everything to the table. By the way, Daniel Jeremiah just put out his top 50 ranking. He had Dalton Kincaid at number nine on his list of players. He's, he's had a Dalton Kincaid crush from the start of the draft process. He upped it even more, putting them in his top 10 in his most recent top 50. So huge Dalton Kincaid supporter in Daniel Jeremiah. Uh, next on his positives is he 
consistently contorts his body to make incredible catches. You will see him spin in air, reaching left, reaching right, going up, down, sideways, any way you can think of. His body is just there to make insane catches. And again, he will be able to adjust his body on the fly, in the air, with a defender draped over him. Contested catches are a very, uh, you're another very strong aspect of his game as well. But just that ability to kind of contort, hang a little bit, and again, do so well battling defenders in the heat of battle, it is something that certainly separates him as a receiving tight end. Speaking of those contested catches, he has phenomenal hands. And this was something, so just as a aside here, I always go through with my positives and the first thing I do is I grade the all 22. And I give my own observations and own scouting report on the all 22 before I look at stats, before I look at any other rankings, before I look at anything else, before I look at any other scouting report, PFF grades, I want to go into that initial all 22 with just my eyes. And then if I go and check some of the other stuff, the PFF stuff, or if I you know, eventually go read another scouting report and something disagrees with mine, then I want to go back and check it. So one of the first things I jotted down when I was reviewing the all 22 was his hands and how incredible his hands were. And then I go and check the stats. He has two drops in his career per PFF. So all those catches, all those touchdowns, all the productivity, only two drops in his career. And it shows up on tape too. There's sometimes where you see a guy and you're like, really? That guy only had two drops because his hands look like stone. There's other times where his hands, I think we went over this the other day a little bit. Um, where we had a tight end who uh, had fantastic hands, really soft hands on tape, uh, but you know certainly did not always come up uh, with the catches. There was uh, yeah, Mayer, Michael Mayer was that way, where it's very soft hands on tape, but uh, he had some drops, and that was one where it didn't always match up. But with Kincaid, it matches up. You have soft hands on tape, contested catches, contorting his body, making crazy plays, and only two drops throughout his time in college per PFF. Uh, he was a team captain. So again, you know he's going to be somebody probably with high-end character, somebody that's going to lead your team. You, you can never have enough of those type of guys in your locker room. He's extremely competitive out on the field. And you might say like, well, Andy, wh why does that matter? So he was extremely competitive. How I view it personally is like, yes, all of these guys are some level of competitive, but when it stands out, amongst those other players, that's noteworthy. And second of all, it leads me to believe that they really care about the game. And when you have somebody who has high-end upside, high-end productivity, has a really fun skill set, and is like a top-tier prospect, the last thing, I, the last, or maybe not last, but like an important box to check is how much they care about this. Is it just that they're going through the motions because they're really good at this and they're going to get a big payday? Or is this something that really matters to them? And with Kincaid, you can really tell that the sport and the game matters to him. And again, he is extremely, extremely competitive. He has fantastic play speed. We don't know how he tested or would have tested, but we can watch the tape and clearly see that he has the ability to separate. He has run after the catch ability. He has speed to separate after the catch. And I think on tape, as you watch him play, you know, even, even just like his instincts and his playability lends him to play faster. And again, I don't know what he would have time tested at on a stopwatch in a 40 yard dash. I don't really care. I would prefer that the tape is fast rather than the 40 yard dash is fast. And he has fantastic play speed. Um, he only played one year of high school football. And there's another one of those things you might say, why does that matter? Because he only played one year of high school football. Then he had the basically like five seasons that he was playing college football, but he is still learning on the job. And it's really impressive that he is so far advanced as a you know route runner and just an overall receiving tight end at this stage when he barely played high school football. Like that is incredible when you really think about it and shows that there's probably still quite a bit of growth and upside here for Dalton Kincaid. Uh, and speaking of which, his route tree and his uh, like actual route running ability I would say is really impressive, especially given his experience. The fact that he didn't play college or high school football, save for one season, you know, basically learned at San Diego, transferred to Utah, basically didn't play much in 2020. And then over the last two seasons tore up, uh, you know, competitive football at the college level. It, again, it just goes to show you the type of athlete and the type of player and the type of competitor that Kincaid is. And then of course, He's a red zone threat with ridiculous production. We talked about all the touchdowns. That's not happenstance. That's not accident. He is a real legitimate red zone threat. 
From a negatives, not a ton here. You can probably guess based on the positives what his negative is. He's not a blocker. He is a get in the way blocker at best. He is basically a big slot wide receiver. And if you're planning on using him as a inline tight end, A, you're just probably using him wrong. And B, it's just probably not going to go very well. So we talked in the last couple episodes with Washington and Mayer of how much more valuable inline tight ends can be because you can use them as an extra blocker. You can use them as a receiver and defensive coordinators and defenses are a little bit more frustrated in having to deal with that type of player because they don't know exactly what you're doing on the play. There's not really a tell. With Dalton Kincaid, like we can basically almost like we almost need a different like category of player, but he's just a slot player at this point. And he gives you a little bit more than like, you know, let's say uh, a Zay Flowers is going to give you in a slot from the block, from a blocking standpoint, they're different players, but they're still like mismatch pieces, you know, whether it's Zay Flowers and his speed and ability to separate, or whether it's Dalton Kincaid and his ability to, you know, basically if you're, you know, you don't know who to put on him. If you're going to cover him speed wise with a corner, Kincaid can just go up and, you know, out jump and out physical the corner. You guys know the mismatches, linebackers too slow, safeties in the middle, it's all, all of the above, but it's just a different type of, you know, weapon in the slot. And that's what Kincaid is. But as a blocker, he's not going to give you much. And he needs to be much more physical overall, not just in the, you know, from a blocking standpoint, but you can see him against more physical players get kind of knocked off of his routes at times, not kind of run through that contact and just be a little bit more of a finesse player. And I think as he is continues, you know, to be competitive and continues to learn the sport more and just continues to, you know, really be a pro's pro, I think you're going to see some of that stuff develop, even his blocking a little bit. But Again, if you're looking at who he is right now, he is a more finesse, big wide receiver than he is this usual all around tight end. And as mentioned, he is not an inline tight end. He is a move tight end, which is fine. Like they, there's a reason they have differences and they have separate titles. One's an inline tight end, one's a move tight end. He's a move tight end and that's great. And you can do a lot of things with that. And like I said, he's kind of like a big slot wide receiver as well. As far as scheme goes, he's a big slot and you can move him around, do a variety of different things. You can probably use him a little bit in like an H-back role, uh, but you're going to want to get him lined up in the slot and being able to get up up the seam, you know, out routes. You, know, you can use him in a variety of different ways, but you just basically know you're getting a big receiver or a big weapon, however you want to view it. And I don't think Jordan Love is going to mind. Like, I don't think Jordan Love is going to be like, man, this guy's awesome. And he can run a variety of different routes and he's tall and he's fast and he can run after the catch. But man, you know, he's not an inline blocker. Like who cares? You, like use them to their strengths. Kincaid has a lot of them. Don't worry about the rest. And I do think Matt LaFleur could get very creative with Kincaid as well and how they would use him. You know, even if you can line him up a little bit in line just to get him on some of those bootleg actions and like going across the uh, grain of the, the play and some of those little tosses in space, Kincaid would kill at those. So there's a variety of different ways you could use him. Uh, but like I said, Matt LaFleur is just going to have to get a bit more creative. His ceiling is a better version of a high-end Zach Ertz, in my opinion. Now, you might think Zach Ertz and like think back of the last couple seasons and be like, ah, that doesn't sound so great. But think of prime Zach Ertz, like the best Zach Ertz from, you know, what, five, six years ago in Philly where he was a real legitimate weapon. I think Kincaid is a, you know, can be a better version of that, like almost two steps better than that. Um, but I do think that that is sort of what you'd be looking at as a high-end ceiling for Kincaid. The floor is probably like a Cameron Bray, a nice receiving tight end who can be a little bit of a weapon in the end zone, good size, good hands, but doesn't give you much as a blocker and you know just is kind of like, all right, you can be a decent number two, but that's probably more of where his floor is at. The comp is Zach Ertz all day, every day. Everyone's used it. Everyone's right. You throw him on and he looks like Zach Ertz. And I think that's what you're getting. And again, I would preface this one more time by saying high-end Zach Ertz. You are getting like prime Zach Ertz when he was really, really good and a real legitimate weapon. But they are so similar and they it's it's so easy to confuse the two or at least comp the two because again, you, you put it on tape and you're like, oh yeah, that's Zach Ertz. And it's, it's not even a question. So very easy to see there. Uh, what he brings to Green Bay, a big slot wide receiver, another weapon for Jordan Love or a weapon at tight end for Jordan Love, a mismatch piece, someone that Matt LaFleur can be creative with and a real legitimate red zone threat. 
as mentioned with all of these tight ends. I think it's no man's land. I don't think he, I know Daniel Jeremiah has him at pick number nine and Daniel Jeremiah knows more about scouting uh, or will forget more about scouting than I will ever know. Um, but I, to me, that would be very rich even at 15 and he's going to be gone by the time they pick in the second round. So once again, that weirdo no man's land for tight ends where Green Bay, yeah, in, he might be gone by, there's a chance he's gone by 15. And even if they move back, like, let's say, hey, we really value Dalton Kincaid, but like at pick 20 or 22, they move back to 20 or 22, like he easily could be gone at pick 18, 19, et cetera. So um, I just think it's a really difficult position with Kincaid. Uh, and again, as with a lot of these tight ends, kind of in no man's land. And I do think that from a Green Bay standpoint, he's not a premium position. He's older aged. And those are two big red flags for what Green Bay likes to do generally in the first round of the draft. So I don't think that this is probably going to be the play, but this is a very interesting draft. He's a really good player at a huge position of need and would give Jordan Love a real fun weapon in the middle of the field. So I wouldn't rule it out, but I don't think it's necessarily likely. All right, let's move to our second tight end for the day, and that is Luke Musgrave. 6'6", 253, a senior tight end out of Oregon State. 22 years old, will turn 23 in September. So not quite as overaged as the near 24 Kincaid, but still probably about a year later than what you'd normally like or what Green Bay normally likes in the first round. 9.77 RAS score though. And we know Green Bay loves the high-end athleticism. Musgrave did all of the testing and tested out well in everything. 90th percentile height, 66th percentile weight, 57th percentile in the bench press, 89th in the vert, 96th in the broad, 93rd in the 40 with a 46140, had a 98th percentile 10 yard split, 56th percentile in the short shuttle, 76th percentile in the three cone. So just absolutely crushed the combine and specifically the testing at the combine. That's all good. The age isn't super over overaged. He's got great size, great athleticism. The production is a lot to be desired. We talked a little bit about this uh, with the, uh, with Washington as well. 2019, he had two catches for 18 yards. 2020, he had 12 catches for 142 yards. 2021, he had 22 catches, 304 yards and a touchdown. In 2022, he had 11 catches, 169 yards and a touchdown. So there hasn't been this high-end production. Now, part of it was due uh, to injury issue this past season. 47 catches, 833 yards, and two touchdowns in his career. Only two touchdowns in his career in 1,179 snaps. Based on his like overall ability, like that is shocking. It is absolutely shocking that he did not have more touchdown receptions. 1,179 snaps, only 47 catches, 833 yards, and two touchdowns. In 2019, he had a 60.9 grade by PFF with 59 snaps. 2020, he had 56.0 grade on 312 snaps. 2021, a 60.1 grade on 694 snaps. And 2022, at a 72.5 grade on only 114 snaps. So that's another thing is that you have the high-end athlete, really low-end production, some injury issues, and mediocre-ish PFF grades. A lot of that due to blocking once again, which we'll talk about more in just a moment, but that is going to leave a little bit to be desired. And he is a true prospect. Like he is uh, somebody that you have to put a little bit of blind faith in because it's, it's not, the talent is easily recognizable on tape. There's no question about that. And I think he would have put up big numbers this past year had he not gotten hurt and had he been able to play the whole entirety of the season. But there's more projection with Musgrave because there's been some injuries, there's been some missed time, there's been a lack of production, there's been some not great grades during the course of his time there. So there's a bit more of saying like, all right, I see all the athleticism. The athleticism shows up on tape, but the production hasn't been there. The play hasn't been there. And that's going to be something that you're going to have to project to the NFL level. From a positive standpoint, he is a tall receiving tight end with great speed, great size, great hands, and great athleticism. Like he is, you look at him and you're like, yeah, that, he, that'll work. And there's like zero question about it. it there, I'm going to go over comps in just a moment, but think of those big gliding tight ends over the middle of the field that can go up and get the ball, hit the seam, 
has great hands. Like it, he's just, he's going to be a weapon. And again, it blows my mind that he only had a couple touchdowns in college. It seems like malpractice. It seems impossible. Like he, he should have like accidentally scored like 10 touchdowns. Like I, so that, that blows my mind a little bit, but again, you see everything you need to see when you turn on the film. He does show speed after the catch as well. So it's not just athletic testing speed. It's not just speed on his routes. He shows speed after the catch. He shows speed at all times, basically, which is a great thing to see from a big tight end. You can really challenge up the seam. And that's one of my favorite aspects of him. I love tight ends, especially the more and more that we see these teams go zone in, in some cover two stuff. Like I love tight ends who can challenge the seam and you, especially with the size that he has, if you've got a little bit of an undersized linebacker, some slower safeties, that hole in the middle of the field, you know, behind the linebacker in front of the safeties or as the safeties are split and the linebacker has to carry them, that is going to be Musgraves all day, every day. And he is going to be a massive weapon in the middle of the field up the seam, depending on how teams want to play against him. So love that. He has clear and obvious red zone potential with his size. And like I said, I don't understand how that did not come to fruition in college. Has very impressive change of direction for his size. Like his, then that goes to the agility, especially the three cone. Like uh, I, I was incredibly impressed how he was able to get out of his breaks again for his size. It's not like he's a, you know, big physical, you know, Darnell Washington type of like bulky, but like, just you look at him, he's so tall and you're like, some sometimes those guys are just kind of gangly and like it's big, long strides, but he's got really good change of direction for his size. And while his blocking leaves a lot to be desired still, he does give effort as a blocker. And sometimes that is a huge step in the process as they develop into being a better blocker. And that's going to pay off because while he is also a move tight end and somebody that is a big wide receiver and somebody you're going to use in the slot a ton, I do think more than Kincaid, you can use him a little bit more as an inline tight end. Not something you want to make a huge habit out of, not something where you want him to play 60 snaps as your main, you know, inline tight end, but couple snaps, you know, not more than a couple, like, you know, 15, 20 snaps a game as an inline tight end, especially in some two tight end sets. Absolutely think you can get away with that with Musgrave. Had the good bench press score, showed some, uh, you know, showed some upper body strength and has good size, gives good effort as a blocker. That's going to help him, even though he is one of the, you know, more receiving tight ends in this draft. Negatives, he's off balance far too often. And some of that's going to hopefully come with, you know, adding some functional strength and, you know, being a little bit more well-rounded as a physical specimen at tight end. But right now he is got kind of that lean build. And like I said, kind of a big skinny wide receiver, really big skinny wide receiver. Um, or I guess you'd be a thicker wide receiver, but a big skinny tight end that looks like a big wide receiver. But because of that, he can get knocked off of balance and you'll see him get on the ground and just off of his routes on far too many occasions. I guess he's a effort blocker, get in the way blocker, but he's not a physical mauling blocker. So again, not that pure all around tight end who you can consistently line up in line and be like, yeah, you could, you know, he's going to be just as good of a blocker as he is as a receiver. No, he's a receiving tight end that can kind of block a little bit. Not all that dissimilar uh, from a blocking standpoint from Robert Tunyon. So much better receiving chops than Tunyon had. But like as a blocker, Tunyon was a effort blocker. He got better over time. I think there's opportunity for Musgrave to get better over time as well and be maybe even more than an adequate blocker at the position. But that again is a little bit of projection. Uh, he is a, um, he's a speed after the catch tight end, but he's not going to give you much else. He's not going to make a move and make you miss. He's not going to break a ton of tackles. He's not going to give you too many stiff arms. He's going to get the ball and he's going to run fast up the field. And that's okay. That's not a bad thing. But if you're looking for him to be a big tight end, who's going to run through people and stiff arm and break tackles, that's usually not too much of Musgrave's game. Again, a little bit more kind of like Kincaid of a finesse player at the position. Did miss time with a knee injury in 2022. Um, had the, the lack of production, the 47 catches, 833 yards and two touchdowns, uh, in his college career overall. And he is a traits-based player with injuries, limited production and an unrefined overall game. So those are some of the negatives. Like I said, overall, he is a projection player. You see everything you need to see. You just didn't see the results. And there's got to be some pause and cause for concern with that and something that you need to evaluate. But it's really hard to watch him on tape and be like, 
yeah, I don't think he's going to be like it, you're drooling over watching him on tape. There's so much potential there. And I, like I said, I really, really like Musgrave and think he can be a really fun option. I know Mike Wall, by the way, we talked about DJ loving uh, Dalton Kincaid, Mike Wall. I think he had, he just posted on Twitter. Like I think it was his like favorite tight end in the draft. So uh, I won't speak for Mike there, but go out on Twitter and find his tweet. And I know he was very high on Luke Musgrave. As far as the scheme standpoint, big slot wide receiver, think sort of same as Kincaid, but can give you a little bit in line, a little bit more as a blocker. And I do think he can develop there over time. I think his ceiling could almost be like a peak Jimmy Graham, prime Jimmy Graham. Don't think Green Bay Jimmy Graham, think early Saints Jimmy Graham. That That is, I think, the, the type of player that you see in Musgrave if he would reach his ceiling. The floor is probably like Daniel Bellinger, the rookie last year for the Giants, who had good size, good receiving ability, not much as a blocker. I think that's probably the floor. Bellinger had a nice year as a rookie. And then the, the easy, easy comp. <laughs> We're going to just go Eagles tight ends today because Kincaid was Ertz and Musgrave is Goddard. And it was this is another one. Everyone uses the Goddard comp and it is just 100% spot on. He immediately will remind you of Dallas Goddard and that's not a bad thing. Goddard's a very, very good tenant. I think Goddard's better as a blocker than Musgrave, but Goddard wasn't really good at it to begin with and had to develop. And I think, again, I think Musgrave's probably in that same boat. What he brings to Green Bay, speed, huge target for Jordan Love. Again, another red zone threat, someone to challenge linebackers up the seam and somebody who I does I, I think does have some high end upside. And that is never a bad thing at the position. Kincaid does too. Like all these guys do. It's a really, really fun tight end class. Just the, the value of the position, the depth of the position, all of it's going to be really interesting. I'm going to go over this tight end position in much greater detail tomorrow. I'm really, really excited for tomorrow's episode. So make sure to check that out. But we'll go over the overall value of the tight ends and if they're worth picking in the first round. Uh, the value is there for Green Bay at the beginning of round two, even if they need to move up. If you could get Luke Musgrave at the beginning of round two, I think that is a phenomenal, phenomenal pick. So if he lasts that long, gets out of the first round, even if you need to move up a little bit, go get Musgrave. And I think you're going to be very happy for whoever would draft him at the beginning of round two. Would Green Bay do it beginning of round two? I think absolutely anything in the first round, I think is going to be a little bit steep for them. Overall, really enjoy both of these tight ends. Um, I th they're both a little bit on the older side, so that's going to be something to monitor and how interested Green Bay is. Once you get to the second round, definitely think that that would be something that Green Bay would be very interested in, although I think it's extremely unlikely that Kincaid gets to that point. But both would be very, very fun receiving options for this offense, for Jordan Love at a huge position of need. Like I, said, I really, really enjoy all four of these tight ends. All are different flavors, all bring something different, but all four are very fun prospects that if you're a fan of the team, you like you if. Green Bay would get any of these guys. We can talk about value and we're going to tomorrow, but they would be fun players for Jordan Love, Matt LaFleur, and this offense. That's going to do it for me today. Make sure to check out tomorrow's episode on the tight ends. Overall, you're not going to want to miss that. It's going to be a really fun conversation. Uh, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.